like um, when the bullets were actually hitting me, I knew that I needed to fire back in the direction of where the bullets are coming from. I couldn't see the shooter. Um, and But I'm lying on my back. He's still shooting me. Bullets are hitting me. Um, I'm lining up to fire back at him. But I realise I'm firing back along the length of my body and the other end of my body are my feet. And when you're lying on your back, your feet are pointing up. Yeah. And the thought that ran through my head is I need to get up just a little bit so that I can shoot over the top of my feet. But I've got weaponry, I've got equipment, I've got flat vests. And as I've lifted my upper body up, my feet have come up to counterbalance. And the thought that runs through my head is I better not shoot myself in the foot because the guys at work would give me shit for the rest of my life. <laughs> Just imagine you get shot for me. Welcome to the Land Life Podcast with your host, PJ Riley. Hey guys, welcome to the Land Life Podcast. My name is PJ Riley. Guys, today, today, we have an international guest. And I'm not talking about just Canada. I know we got a bunch, we've had a few Canadians on here before, but we're going far. It's 6 30 in the morning where Derek lives right now. So 6 30 in the morning, he just woke up. He got no sleep. He agreed to meet with us. Uh, we're working with 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 his schedule. You know, he's he's being a nice guy for us. Um, Derek McManus. Where do you live? What part of Australia? South Australia, Adelaide. Okay. We're yeah. talking and beaches. We're the talking, great, the we're greatest talking. wine region in the world, I'd like to think. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Derek is a counterterrorism operative. I got to read this, by the way, because he's got it's a long thing. A counterterrorism oper- operative, hostage shooting survivor, motivational speaker, and I want to get into this in a little bit, a human, dura- human durability expert. Derek. Kind of give us a little background on you, who you are, kind of what you got started into this, I guess, this new endeavor with, uh, with, with speaking and, and coaching and helping people build their lives and businesses. Yeah, beautiful. I love people asking me, uh, you know, my background, who I am, uh, because who I am is a father. I'm a father of four kids, two biological, two stepchildren, um, and that's my main focus. Yeah. Obviously, for the uh, for the podcast, that's probably not the main focus. <laughs> um, that focus uh, for the podcast is that uh, I've been 42 years as a policeman here in Australia. Okay. And uh, I was operating for 11 years in a section called Star Group. Special task and rescue, high-risk arrest, hostage siege, counter-terrorism, uh, VIP security to the Queen when the Queen came out, wow. cliff rescue, cave rescue, mine rescue. I was a diver, so deep water you know, recovering bodies and evidence and exploration and all those sorts of things. Um, and so we're more aligned with the Navy SEALs than we are with anybody else in, in America. Lots of people align us with SWAT, but it's more Navy SEAL style. So I was trained by our military elite in counterterrorism. Um, in 1994, my section were asked to go and arrest a guy uh, who had a warrant for 197 counts of fraud. Not something normally associated with violence, but we knew his history. So we were asked to go and arrest him. Clearly, he did not want to be arrested. And clearly, I'm very bad at taking hints. Uh, because he started <laughs> shooting. He fired 18 times with a Chinese military rifle. Um, and he fired 18 times. He hit me 14 times. I was then lying on the ground for about three hours with massive life-threatening injuries. Uh, one uh, of my arteries in my left forearm was severed. Um, and then I was lying on the ground with a severed artery for about three hours. Uh, another artery in my right wrist was severed, but that was blocked by the piece of shrapnel. Two bullets in the stomach, two bullets in the thigh, one through my right Achilles tendon. And then I call them other little bits and pieces. But I was hit, eight to, I was hit 14 times. Wow. Um, I lost so much blood in that three hours that the first doctor to get to me said he doesn't know how I'm alive. Um, he actually said that with the blood that I'd lost, my heart should have stopped. Um, all the textbooks say my heart should have stopped. The only reason I'm alive is I hadn't read the textbooks. That's his words. Um, wow. But obviously it became very close. He, uh, when he got to me, he didn't know whether I was dead or alive. He said that I was about 30 seconds from death um, and he just worked his magic. Um, and you know, then it becomes all about the recovery after that. And the recovery, it had its highs, its lows, its achievements, its disappointments. Doctors told me I should never be able to walk properly again with the injuries I have. 
Um, but I have been able to go back to fully operational in Star Group, uh, bike riding, cycling, um, basketball, football, soccer, absolutely everything. My life is full again. I still carry massive injuries uh, and massive disablements, but not the disabilities that other people believe they are. And in an entrepreneur type mindset, it's that sort of attitude that you need to sort of embrace. People tell me that talk, people told me I should never be able to walk properly again. Now I listened to them. I then spoke to other experts who gave me some advice on how I might have a chance to do it. And I followed them. Even though other people were saying I couldn't, I took their advice. It's the same for entrepreneurs. People go, why would you even try doing that? But let's talk to the people who are actually going to support us and help us to get to where we are. Um, and uh, so I spoke to these people and did what they said. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm fully operational these days. Yeah. Well, I'm retired these days, uh, but fully active, even though the doctor said I probably couldn't be. Wow. So that's, that's a huge... Um... That's a huge thing to happen in your life. Uh, so how did you transition though? Okay, so you're, you're a police officer, right? You're a police yeah. officer, you're doing this every day. At what point do you transition to the position you're in now and, and why? Like what made you want to, to move to that, that different, well, completely different career? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it is, it's a completely different career. Um, obviously the shooting is a big story. It's, yeah. and, and believe me or not, it, it's, um, it's a fascinating story, but it's also a hilarious story. Um, I talk to people over coffee and wine and all the rest of it, and I can have a laugh at some of the stuff that happened uh, at the time that I was being shot and while I was lying on the ground. Like um, when the bullets were actually hitting me, I knew that I needed to fire back in the direction of where the bullets are coming from. I couldn't see the shooter. Um, and, but I'm lying on my back. He's still shooting me. Bullets are hitting me. Um, I'm lining up to fire back at him, but I realize I'm firing back along the length of my body and the other end of my body are my feet. And when you're lying on your back, your feet are pointing up. Yeah. And the thought that ran through my head is I need to get up just a little bit so that I can shoot over the top of my feet. But I've got weaponry, I've got equipment, I've got flat vests. And as I've lifted my upper body up, my feet have come up to counterbalance. True. And the thought that runs through my head is I better not shoot myself in the foot because the guys at work would give me shit for the rest of my life. <laughs> Imagine you get shot 14 times and then you shoot yourself as well. Now, that's not a matter of being overwhelmed. It's not a matter of living in denial. It's not a matter of not accepting reality. It was that I was so well prepared for the challenges that I knew I could uh, encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, my job was high-risk arrest, hostage siege, counter-terrorism. The chances of being shot and injured uh, and maybe shot and killed were real. And I had that conversation with my wife five years beforehand. Now, I'm going to come back to that part of the story about having that conversation sure. when I talk about having uh, proactive accepting responsibility for our life. I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, but how I got into this was, you know, I'd be talking to people over a coffee or a glass of wine. And uh, they'd go, you have got to come and tell my people at my company about that story. And I've got no chance, no way in the world, because I thought they wanted the hero story. And I didn't want to tell the hero story. The heroes were the guys who came and rescued me, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to pay money for a hero story, pay them. I'm not taking your money for a hero story. Uh, and knocked it back. But then the blood service, they, uh, they heard me talking about it and they said it would be interesting for the blood donors and they said Derek you used a stack of blood so body holds 10 units of blood yeah. I used 24 units of blood or blood product in seven hours uh, and they said you used a stack of blood would you like to come and say thank you <laughs> now obviously they were leveraging that a little bit sure but saying thank you not a problem at all because that's not about me it's saying thank you to them because their donation to blood definitely saved my life. Um, but once I started speaking to them and just telling them the story and some of the thoughts that ran through my mind, um, I found out that there was more to this than the hero story. And when there was more to this than the hero story and other people were taking things out of it, I've gone, okay, yes, 
I could stand on stage and start telling that story with those messages. Um, and so it became this interest in doing these things and then it just exploded to the point where I've now come up with my own psychological philosophy that uh, the School of Psychology at University of South Australia are actually engaging with me and want to help me research this human durability. Explain that. So I, I looked that up a little bit and I read some of your information on the human durability model. What exactly does that mean? And kind of explain it to like the, the average person so they can understand it. Yeah, excellent. Now, I, I like the fact that you uh, you looked it up because I've had some clients in, uh, in the uh, industry uh, ring me up and go, Derek, would like to come and talk to you. Uh, would you to come and talk to us about human durability? Um, and we've looked it up online, but there's nobody else that talks about it. What the hell is it? Um, so it is something that I've created myself. When I was first speaking, I was speaking just about purely personal leadership. Then I delved into talking about resilience, and resilience is a very powerful thing. Uh, but resilience essentially, as people, most people see it, is the ability to encounter a problem and then bounce back. Right, it, it's waiting for something to happen, and when something happens, problem solving it and bouncing back from it. Very powerful thing to have. Um, I these days I actually talk about two different models of resilience. Uh, one is functional resilience, the resilience we need every day, just be able to get through the stuff we do daily, the stuff we do weekly, the stuff we do monthly is the functional stuff just to keep on going. Mm -hmm. The second model of resilience is aspirational. And this is the resilience that entrepreneurs will really want to know about. So I'll come back and talk about that again in a moment okay. too. But, but that is the stuff to power forward, to take on the challenges. We know are going to be hard, but we're passionate about them. We want to make them happen. And this is the stuff that I had in Star Group, to take on those tasks that everybody else goes, oh, my God, why would you do that? No, I love it. I've been trained. I want it. I've got the skills. I want to use those skills to achieve this. And that's... That's the entrepreneurial mindset. But human durability is another thing that uh, an entrepreneur will take to because on, um, human durability is the ability to sustain optimal performance despite the challenges in front of us. Op uh, human durability is that point in life where we are 100% reliable. Everything is going exactly the way we want it. We know exactly what's going to happen. We can predict the outcome of our behaviors and our actions. Um, these are the days that you feel like you are the master of your craft, yeah. right? You are the expert and people are coming to you. It is 100% reliable. You know exactly what you want to do. Now, this is where I was in Star Group. We had all the training. We had all the expertise. We had all the equipment. We were 100% reliable to do what we wanted to do but we knew we were taking on challenges um, that were new and exciting but they also presented problems we hadn't seen before and so we knew we had to be absolutely 100% reliable here also anticipating that as we take on the next challenge we would actually slide back just that little bit to being resilient again um, and that comes into a continuum of human durability. But human durability is that ability to sustain optimal performance. Okay, so <clears throat> it, it's, it's the ability to sustain optimal performance. What I see with entrepreneurs a lot of times is um, they want to stay at that level forever. They always yeah. want to be on. You know, they have to be on at all times because if you if you regress, if you if you start to slack off, you feel like you're losing something. You know. That unfortunately, that constant level of you know trying to stay at the highest level leads to some some sort of burnout. Absolutely right. Absolutely. So yeah. you, you're trying to stay big. You're trying to stay successful, wealthy. You're trying to you know do the new things in your business that everybody else is doing. You got to be fit too because you got to be. It doesn't do you any good if you're rich if you if you if you're you know out of shape and 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 right. uh, you know overweight. Um, so you want to be fit, you want to be smart, you want to be wealthy, you got to be a great parent, because if you go home, you don't want to go home if everyone hates you at home, so you got to do that too. So where, maybe explain how the human durability model meets that level of entrepreneur that's always trying to hit that level. Okay, so this is really, I, I love this part of the conversation. I put human durability on a continuum with 
um, fragility at one end where we first start. But whenever we start something brand new, and this is the entrepreneur as well, you are starting into a market brand new. You want to try and prove yourself as being absolutely reliable. I know exactly what I'm doing. Invest in me. But you actually know that you're fragile. You're going into something brand new. You're not sure exactly how it's going to work because nobody else has done it before. So you are there. Um, and it's just a mindset. But we've got to understand that in this uh, model of um, on this continuum that uh, we are new, we're learning, we're uh, making mistakes, we're experimenting, but we and that's where everybody starts. When you start a new sport and you start a new relationship, start a new job, whatever it might be, this is where we start. There's a little bit of fragility. We don't want to stay there. We're keen, we're eager. We want to get to the place where we are resilient, and this is halfway along the model. Um, and resilient is being in that place where we know we can solve problems. We're relaxed, we're confident, we're self-assured, but we're still reactive. The next step on from that is durability. So durability, 100% reliable, we're proactive, we're prepared, we're insightful. And when we're at this 100% reliable, there is no stress, right? You know how you said you're always on, you're always trying to stretch yourself, you're always kind of stressed, and that can lead to burnout. 100% reliable, no stress, because you know exactly where things are going, exactly how they're going to work. With an entrepreneur, we will take on that next challenge. And that next challenge is the step up. And when we take that step up, we actually slide back a little bit, right? We're no longer 100% reliable. We slide back along that continuum to resilient because we've taken on a new challenge. There are new things to learn. There's new politics, new finance, new uh, people to interact with, all those sorts of things. So there are new problems. We've just got to be able to anticipate that and say, I understand when I take on this challenge, there's new learnings, I'm going to slide back. The problem comes in when we take on the challenge, we slide back, but we're not actually solving problems. We slide all the way back to fragile, where we're not sure exactly what's going on. We're learning, we're making mistakes, we're experimenting. But we stay out there so long that we get stressed, we get anxiety, we get uh, to the point where we're absolutely exhausted. And then there's the burnout and we drop. As an entrepreneur, we've got to know how to move from functional resilience to the aspirational resilience and then back to functional again. Because every now and then, you've got to go, I'm stretching myself. Actually, I've been stretching myself so long, I need to take a step down mm -hmm. and back to that point where I'm 100% reliable. Go back to doing everything that I know how to do because when we come back to this 100% reliable, as I said, there's no stress in this place. So when we come back to this place of no stress, it's, it's being vulnerable and it's being human to say that I need to just take a step back. I need to refresh. I need to replenish. I need to re-energize. And then I can re-engage, right? And once we're, we're refreshed, replenished, re-energized, then we can take on that challenge again. And when we take on that challenge with this refreshed attitude, we sometimes go, oh my gosh, what was I worried about? That's not as hard as I thought because we're no longer stressed out anymore. Okay, we've come back, we've relaxed. Our mind relaxes, our body relaxes. We see opportunities or possibilities that we just don't see in that stressed out state. So every now and then, but, and, and where we're up here, this is aspirational. This is the aspirational resilience we need to keep on going. Every now and then we've got to go, been out here too long. I just need to come back here for a minute, an hour, a week, go away and have a holiday with the kids, come back again, take time out and go and see the kids sport, um, indulge yourself and, and go and watch a movie or have a holiday because we need to take that pressure off every now and then sure. so that our mind relaxes, our body relaxes, and we've got the energy to keep on going. Sure. How do you, how does an entrepreneur know that they're there? Because I feel like sometimes... I get to that point where it's, I'm, I'm, I've done too much, but it's too late, right? I, I, I've just kept going and going and going, and maybe I've worked out too much or I've, I've worked too much. And by the time I realize I'm there, it's too late. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm way over burnout. And now I'm just, just beat up and, and, and uh, you know, things are going terribly. So how do yeah. you, how do you, what's a strategy to realize that you're in the wrong, in the wrong position, I guess? 
So for me, it's about, first of all, knowing that this is a real thing and accepting that everybody goes through this. Mm -hmm. Now, how many people have gone through burnout and depression, gone through to PTSD? If it happens to other people, there's no reason why it can't happen to us, yeah. right? It doesn't have to happen to us, but there's no reason it can't. And just purely accepting that makes us open enough to go, oh, actually, I can see the signs. Yeah. And it's about recognizing those signs and saying, actually, I just need to take a step back for a little while maybe wind down and just uh, take stock of where I am. The, the greatest indicators are we're not getting enough sleep, we're not eating properly, uh, we're starting to get bitey, bitchy, um, tired, uh, no patience. Those are the, the basic indicators. We're not able to talk to people the way we used to. We're, we're not able to think through problems and solve the problems the easy way we used to. So it's about knowing what those indicators are. And when you see the indicator, you go, that's a sign. I've actually got to fit back to functional resilience, refresh, replenish, re-energize, and then come back and do it again. Um, yeah. And okay. the first part of that is just being open to the fact that it's possible and I may need to step down. Okay. For entrepreneurs, that's, that's going to be... <clears throat> Sorry, that's going to be super hard. So really pay attention to this. Use these uh, strategies when you have, when you start to feel yourself burning out just a little bit, or, you know, pull back, take it easy. Because I know, I know entrepreneurs, they don't do that. You know, they don't, they don't we to. get to a point where it's too late and then, you know, and then everything falls apart. So, you know, like Derek said, when there's a, when you realize these things are starting to happen, figure out a strategy, pull back a little bit, reset, and then get back after it. Absolutely. And the longer we stay out there stretching ourselves in that place of resilience, always solving problems, the longer we stay out there, the longer we've got to come back and reset yeah. and relax. If we see the signs and we just go, oh, I'm a little bit tired. I'm like, okay, it's time for me to get some more sleep, eat properly, go and indulge myself, go out. And as you said before, get active, um, have some understanding for myself. Um, and the earlier we can do that, the less time we have to spend doing it because our body refreshes really, really quickly. Now, I'm the same as you. I've trained hard. I've pushed myself. And there are times because of the work that I did uh, in Star Group uh, and certainly now in my own business, and I was telling you before, I was up until 3 o'clock in the morning. It's now 6.30. I only got a few hours sleep because there were things happening around home. I know I push myself every now and then. And when I was in Star Group, I knew I could go for about three days with just having three hours sleep a night mm. um, and, and I would be able to operate and I'd still be patient and thoughtful and creative and, and all the rest of it. You didn't want to be around me on that fourth day though because I know that's the time when I just drop and I get bitchy and I snap people's heads off and, and ideas go out the window because I just can't be bothered. Um, but we don't want to get to that point. We want to be able to stop it earlier and the sooner we catch it, the faster it happens. Now, this is testament to the fact that as much as I said before, I returned to work fully operational after all those injuries. Mm. One of the other things that surprises people is that I was lying on the ground for three hours. Uh, I've lost so much blood that I saw the white light. I was consciously monitoring my body closing down. Uh, I felt my arms and my legs getting weaker and the pistol that I was holding on to protect myself from the shooter who was still shooting fell out of my hand. It's a massively stressful environment. Um, and about five, six days after the shooting, I threw my hand in there and said, get me a psych. I want to talk to a psych. Now, it wasn't because I was weak. It wasn't because I thought I was going to have problems. I just wanted to be able to pick their brain to find out what my future was going to be like. Hmm. Um, and I knew that, as I say, it's happened to other people. There's no reason why it couldn't happen to me. People have nightmares, flashbacks, trauma, PTSD, um, triggers that just take them right back to that moment. I knew this was possible. I wanted to pick the brain of the psych and say, who's dealt with it well? Who's dealt with it badly? What can I anticipate? If it does happen, what are the signs? And how can I manage them? Um, everybody expected that after this shooting, that stressful environment, I'd be in psych therapy for decades. Mm -hmm. I 
I had one meeting with the psychiatrist, one of the best in Australia. Uh, one meeting took about three hours. He picked my brain, I picked his brain. And at the end of that three hours, he said, Derek, psychologically, you can go back to work tomorrow um, and you never need to come back and see me again unless you want to do so. Yeah. And this is where the, the philosophy for human durability has come from. Um, there are so many psychiatrists and psychologists who just want to sit down and have a conversation with me and say, okay, what was your thought process? What were you doing? What, how did you manage that? And how do you not have to be in therapy for such a long period of time? Sure. There's other people that do it as well. It's not just me, but it's a rarity. It's definitely a rarity. But this is where the human durability has come from. And it is just that openness to going, it's happened to other people, it could happen to me. Let me prepare myself so that when I see the signs, I've got the answers. Yeah. Would you recommend other entrepreneurs and other people in your position go go meet with somebody and, and kind of pick their brain like you did? Absolutely. <clears throat> and pick their brain about psychology and stress and all the rest of it, but pick their brain about your business too. Pick their brain about how do you keep enthused? How do you uh, engage with marketing? We're not experts on everything. We've got to engage with other people. When we try to be the only source of knowledge for ourselves, that's when we stay out and we stay stressed and, and really pushing ourselves because we're not vulnerable enough to be able to go and say, Actually, do you know something? I want to do this, but I'm not exactly sure how to do it all. Give me some advice. Give me some insights. Just give me some assistance. We can't do anything. Uh, we can. My, my thoughts are there is nothing that we can do in life all by ourselves, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can do some bits by ourselves, but we need a team around us. Um, Absolutely. That's so hard for most people. Just a team of advisors or supporting us. Yeah, that, that's so difficult for most people, especially entrepreneurs that have this idea, they want to, you know, put it into fruition, they want to build this business, they want to do it all themselves, but they're so afraid that if they give away a piece of it, they'll lose something. When in yeah, fact, right. it just yeah. multiplies the, the, the work that you're doing now. When you bring in a yeah. team, you bring in help, you know, you bring in different assistants and different parts of the business, you know, it, it definitely helps. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit. I know you help businesses um, and I wanted to ask you uh, how you create a, uh, you talk about this to other businesses. So I'm just kind of piggybacking off what you already do. Uh, how do yeah. you create a no stress workplace in, in a chaotic environment? So we're in a big, huge business right now and things are going really fast. How do you bring the stress level down? One of the easiest ways to bring the stress levels down is to have open communication and allow everybody to have that moment of going, actually, do you know something? I just need some time out. I just need to take a moment here. Um, I need, and, and creating a, a, an atmosphere where it's okay to say, I don't know how to do this. Can somebody give me some assistance? Uh, and that, you know, that was me being vulnerable enough uh, to throw my hand in there and say, give me a, get me a psych. Um, having that, openness and that vulnerability to going i don't know everything just brings stress levels right down it's also being in an environment creating an environment where you know that everybody that you work with has your back if you stretch yourself at the front end something doesn't go quite right um, you know that everybody in your team is going to come through pick up the pieces and help you to move forward for me in the shooting, and this, you know, a lot of these things relate to the shooting, but the shooting is only a, a pointy place where all this I can I, I can pick bits out of it. But these philosophies, these attitudes, these environments are something that permeate throughout my whole life. So this environment where you know you've got your team 100 percent behind you. Uh, for the three hours that I was lying on the ground, the one thing that I knew was my mates would be with me as soon as they possibly could. That gave me a sense of optimism, a belief that somebody was going to be doing something to help me get out of this. And that pure sense of optimism, right, was the one thing that just kept me buoyed. And it will keep anybody buoyed if we can have this sense of optimism. The, the guys in my section took it to such an extent that as I was being treated by the doctor, the doctor was standing in direct line of fire. One of the guys that was uh, standing around came up to the doctor and said, don't worry about the shooter, don't worry about the bullets. I've got a flat vest on. I'm going to stand between you and the shooter. If the bullets come this way, 
uh, I'm going to be the one who gets hit, but I've got a flat vest on, so I'm going to be all right, and so will you. That's the extent that people uh, went to to create that environment where we knew somebody was going to be looking after us. But there are essentially five drivers for success. Okay. And these are five drivers we need in any environment. The first one is that sense of optimism, that belief that there is something better and we want to have it, right? And we can see it, we can feel it, and we know that if we do the right things, we can have it. It's that sense of optimism. It's more than hope. Hope is passive. Hope is, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to hope that something happens, yeah. right? Optimism is the pragmatic, practical tools and, uh, and, and processes behind hope that give you that extra sense that something is going to happen. So optimism is the first one. A belief in your ability to influence your future, right? Um, there are some things we can't influence, but we can influence how it affects us. But if we believe that our actions will make a difference to our future, mm -hmm. that just buoys that sense of optimism. The third one is doing something meaningful. Uh, because when we're doing something meaningful that we're really passionate about, that's when people start going, oh, my God, I can't wait to get there. And everybody's really excited to be at work and they're looking after each other. But it's that having that meaningful uh, thing to do. It's good to know what you want to do. It's more important to know why you want to do it. Yeah. And that why is what gives meaning to everything. Uh, the fourth one is to give, have a plan. Just some idea of what you're going to deal with, some idea of how you're going to deal with it. Um, so in a business environment, it's telling people, keeping people up to date with where you are and how their actions fit into the overall environment, mm. giving them meaning that their uh, whatever they're doing is going to make a difference to the overall thing, letting people know what that plan is or helping them to have a plan for what they're going to do and how they're going to get to where they want to be. Um, and the fifth one is essentially what I've been talking about all the time. Um, it's about support. And support is uh, being able to throw your hand in the air and say, actually, I don't know what I'm doing here, or I'm really passionate about this, but I need some more information. Can you help me? Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurs are always going to be driving their own business. They're the ones with the ideas, but we need to be able to throw our hand in the air every now and then um, and say, I need support. It may not be support with your idea. It may be support financially. It may be support psychologically. It may be support um, in getting your admin done while you focus on it. There's all sorts of support, but we can't do it all ourselves. And it's about being comfortable enough to throw your hand in the air. Yeah. So those five drivers, I believe, optimism, influence, meaning, plan, and support. Great. And I'll put those at the bottom of the, uh, in the, in the show notes as well. Um, guys, it's a lot of actionable information here. You know, this is a lot of things you can actually physically go out and do literally today, you know, put those five into practice. You can, you can uh, assess your situation where you're at. Are you overstressed stretching yourself in this aspect of business or in this aspect of life? I mean, this is a ton of actionable stuff guys. So, you know, Derek's provided a ton for us. Uh, that we can actually go out and use today versus just theory. And, and you know, when you're talking about actionable stuff, I, I believe everything that I do is practical and pragmatic and mm. actionable uh, immediately. And so I know we don't have a lot of time left for this podcast. So there's three things that three things that I want to do. I want to talk about these taking responsibility, and then I'd love to be able to talk through the functional and the aspirational resilience. Absolutely. Uh, right unless you've got somewhere else that you'd like to go with this. That is perfect with me, man. You got it. You got it. You're the expert here. I'm, I'm just listening. I'm learning here. I'm learning alongside anybody else. So I'm learning just as much as everybody else. It's a selfish podcast. Uh, and, 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 you know, just addressing that I'm learning with everybody else. One of the things that I love doing the talking, running the workshops that I do is that people ask me questions. And sometimes I'll just go, I'm actually not sure. Let's talk this through. <laughs> And in talking it through, I go, oh, actually, that makes sense. I can throw this into one of my other models and just build out everything. But um, when I talk about taking responsibility, and this is something really important for entrepreneurs, I talk about taking responsibility on four levels. Most people only talk about three. Um, and as leaders, we only get to about three. And that's, what, that's our mindset. I'll talk about a fourth. The first one is 
you know, everybody says we've got to take responsibility for choice. We've got to take then responsibility for our actions or our behaviours. Mm -hmm. And then most people talk about taking responsibility for the consequence. But if you've ever been a parent or a leader or a manager, you only have uh, conversations about taking responsibility for the negative stuff. Because that's when we sit down and have a conversation. Okay, this has gone wrong. We need to, you need to take responsibility for this. But as entrepreneurs, I like to get people's mindset to we've got to take responsibility for the negative. It's more important to take responsibility for the positive as well. Yeah. The stuff that goes really well. When we take responsibility for the fact that we made a choice, we took action that created this good stuff. Let's find out how we created that and then leverage those systems. Hmm. Right. So let's take responsibility for the good and the negative. The fourth one is we've got to take responsibility for the future after that consequence, whether it's good or bad. But we need to take this responsibility and have actionable plans before we actually make that choice to take that action. We've got to think through all four steps. Um, and this is what I was talking to you about before. I had a conversation with my wife um, five years prior to the shooting. And I said to her, um, going into Star Group, it's going to be a sensational place, absolutely great boys' toys. We're going to be doing all the exciting stuff. But there are some dangers, right? And I may be shot and injured. I may be shot and killed. So I was taking responsibility for my choice, my behavior, and the consequences. Going to be some great stuff, but there's dangers as well. But I then took responsibility for the future afterwards. And I said to her, if I get shot and I die, what's your life going to look like? Because it's not just about us. It's about all of our family, our friends, our team, everybody who's impacted by our choices and our actions yeah. and the possible consequences. And we had conversations about would she go on and get married? Would she stay single? Um, and it's not about me giving her permission, but let's be really clear about these conversations. Sure. The last thing we want is somebody going, oh my gosh, what would Derek have wanted? Would he have wanted me to? No, let's be really clear about it. And it doesn't have to be completely stressful because... I did throw her a third option. I said, you may go on and get married. You may stay single, but you may just want to build a little shrine in the corner and just worship me every day. <laughs> Apparently that one wasn't popular, but that was a real <laughs> conversation we had. Yeah. You know, And it was that just take responsibility, but just finding a way to break the tension yeah. and then keep that conversation going. So taking responsibility on those four levels is essential before we go forward. Uh, and we don't have to get stressed about it, but we just have to have those conversations. Sure. Yeah, preparation. That's amazing. That's 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 something a lot of people don't do, especially in a personal relationship. You know, there's not a lot of it's it's usually, hey, you sit over there, I'm gonna run the business, I'm gonna take care of everything. And you know, we 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 don't we never talk about as in a in a relationship sense, you know, what happens if this happens? What do we do if this happens? You know, you just have the entrepreneur, he takes off and they follow suit. Absolutely. And, and what I've gathered from most people is that they have the conversation in their head, but they just don't have it with each other. Oh, dude, that's and there's, huge. This, there's this fear that if I have this conversation, you'll come up with some negatives and you'll stop me wanting to do this. So I'll just avoid that conversation. Or it's so scary that we don't want to talk about it, but you'll work it out. If it does happen, you'll know how to handle it. You know, you'll have support. You'll have... No, no, let's have the conversation um, because that, when you're talking about bringing down stress levels, that actually brings down the stress level because yeah. you will have those conversations and both people will be on the same page. And then that really high stress point that you're worried about and you're trying to avoid, you don't need to avoid it anymore. We've had the conversation and we can have deeper conversations about it because we're now both on the same page. I know you support me. I know you, you know I support you uh, and we're both looking after each other. That's amazing. That is that is something that, that I have never heard anyone say out loud or talk about in, in, a, in a business sense, in an entrepreneurial sense or anything like that. But that's such a big, that'll lift such a big weight off your shoulder too. You know, yeah. if, if that's, those conversations are already done, you can march forward now and, and, and take care of your business and take care of everything you need to take care of without that fear of what if, you know, what if this happens or how does she feel about this? Yeah, yeah. And you just hit right on the nail, uh, the nail right on the head. Um, and, and I've got a model for human durability and how we go through that thought process 
and we won't have time to talk about it now, but sure. I can certainly come back and talk about it another time if you, you know, Yeah, let's go. Let's go. We got a few, we got, we got time. Let's go. <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually want to talk about the, the two more impactful things are actually the two models for resilience. I want to talk about those. Absolutely. But I want to pick up on what you just said about finding that level of comfort. When we have these conversations and we go through this model, which is, you know, all the processes that I've spoke about just fit into this model for durability. But when we have that, I say that there are two levels of comfort that come out of it. The first level of comfort is that, oh my God, there are big challenges. I don't know whether I'll be able to do it, but let's see, have I got the finances? Have I got the resources? Have I got the team? Have I got the family support? Have I got all the experts? Have I got all the things that I need? Um, and if I have, it's actually nowhere near as scary as what I thought it was going to be. I've got all those things. We can handle it. Bang, let's go forward. Let's go hard. Let's go fast. Let's go confidently. Um, and so that's a real comfort level where you, you actually get more excited. The second level of comfort is that actually maybe I don't have the finance or maybe I don't have the family support or maybe I don't have the experts in place. Maybe I don't. So we've, we've identified the gaps and we can comfortably say, no, I'm not going to do that right now. I need to just step back and make sure I get these things in place. But when we step back, the comfort comes from being able to articulate the reason why you're stepping back rather than just going, oh, it doesn't feel right. I'm yeah. nervous. I'm not sure. And people start going, oh, well, what sort of entrepreneur are you? No, <laughs> let's have this conversation. Let's go through the thought process and be able to articulate the reasons. Because when we can articulate the reasons, the team around us will go, He's a thinker or she's a thinker. They are a thinker. Uh, my God, they are right on the ball. They know exactly what's going on. And they're more likely to get engaged with you. Even though you're saying, not at the moment, we've got to fix this. Excellent. Smart move. Yeah, let's fix that. And then let's get on board. It builds confidence in everybody else. So that that's spot on what you said there. It's just finding that level of comfort for where you're going forward. Yeah, it's strategizing too. You know, you're as opposed to just running full bore and at something, you know, you're actually thinking about it a little more, uh, clear, making things a little more clear so that you can, like you said, pull back and then you're, you're, you're more able to surge forward and be more successful, um, you know, down the road, uh, as opposed to where, where you would be if you just kept going forward and, and, and kept failing. Nelson uh, Mandela, uh, he actually said, um, we can't prepare for the future while secretly prepare, uh, pretending it's not going to happen. And that's living in denial. If you're living in denial, you can't actually properly prepare for it. The more we have these open conversations about what the future really might look like, the more we can actually prepare for it and then be able to create outcomes by design rather than outcomes by, oh, I hope it works. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this has worked for other people. It should work for me. And yeah, this is about yeah. risk management rather than risk taking. Just because it's worked for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. They may have some resources that you don't actually see. So let's do some risk. We're always going to be taking risks. Entrepreneur, it's a risky environment. But let's manage those risks rather than just take risks because other people are. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't do what you want to. Sometimes there are gaps there that you need to be able to fill. And the more you're able to proactively fill them, the more chance you've yeah. got of success. Yeah, Derek, you're really talking about building a great foundation too with a business. You're, you're, you're explaining how to build the foundation first so that you have a great thing to step on, right? So, yeah. and, and during the course of the business, keep going back to that foundation, making sure it's solid, making sure it's able to be stepped on and you can propel your business from that foundation. You know, you don't want a weak foundation. That's, that's a big that's no, going to no, collapse no. the whole building, right? So you're Absolutely. saying keep going back and keep making sure that thing is steady the whole time. Like, I don't think anybody Absolutely. really talks about that because it's not, um, you know, people want to talk about, at least, at least most coaches and speakers want to talk about ways to make money, right? Ways to make, yes. to build a business, to make a lot of money. But nobody talks about going back to that foundation and making sure it's solid and steady the whole time. Absolutely. And, and this you know, comes back to a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs type thing, right? You've got to have those base level of needs before you can start building the higher ones. But yeah. once we get up to building the higher ones, we kind of ignore those lower ones, right? And if you're building the higher ones and then somebody pulls out a block at the bottom, 
unless you go back and fix it and put that block back in, the whole thing's going to collapse. It may grow for a little while, but it's always going to be unstable and always likely to go like that. We've just got to keep that foundation going so that we can keep on building. And this is where we've got to switch from aspirational resilience to power forward, back to functional resilience where we can actually relax, replenish, re-energize, and then come back and re-engage. Yeah, Derek, you got a lot of great stuff to, pe to teach people. Um, how can people, or is there anything else you want to talk about before we, we wrap up? Oh, listen, we haven't spoken about the uh, the two models of resilience. So okay. I know we've got to wrap up really quickly. So I'm going to go through them in, in, in two minutes, right? Let's a minute do it. Piece. So the first functional resilience, right? There are six steps to this, six things we need to do for every week, every day, every month, whatever it might be. The first one is sleep and nutrition. As soon as you start feeling tired, you start to get stressed, things aren't going right, sleep and nutrition. Just make sure you get it. I'm not, I'm not a nutrition Nazi. I'll eat chocolate and lollies and all that sort of stuff. But once I start getting stressed, get good nutrition, feed the body, have meaningful connections, right? We've all got massive circle of friends. We've got people that we really enjoy talking to, but then we've got those people who we know have got our back. We have them as a brother or sister. These are the people that we can talk to about anything and they will just want to make it good for us. Meaningful connections, these are the things that we've got to nurture. We've got to have empathy for ourselves and empathy for other, people's, uh, other people because that just breaks stress levels. Empathy for ourselves is compassion. I do mis make mistakes. I don't see everything. I don't, I'm not an expert in every area. I need to be vulnerable enough to accept that I make a mistake, accept that I need to relax sometimes. I can't keep on pushing. But we've got to have empathy for other people too because you know sometimes, especially when we start getting stressed and tired and we don't have patience, we see other people do something and we go, oh my God, how can that be so stupid? Our stress levels go up because of what they're doing. But if we can sort of understand that actually some people have hard lives themselves, Maybe mm. some people aren't thinking smart, they, they make mistakes, uh, they say things they don't mean. Have empathy for them and go, I'm not sure what they're going through. I hope they're able to sort it. Bang, your stress levels come straight down. Yeah. Get active. You started out the podcast talking about being active and, and being fit enough to do what you want to do. You don't have to be elite active, but you just have to be active enough to get that blood going. Um, the fifth one is indulge yourself. Be prepared to allow yourself to go and have some time off. Take five minutes to go and do whatever. Take five days to go and spend some time with the family. Because when we relax and we indulge ourselves guilt-free, then our stress levels come down almost immediately. Uh, and the last one is if you do those five, you can come back to those challenges and just reframe the challenges. And that's what I was saying before. Sometimes you just come back to them and just go, my God, this is nowhere near as bad as what I thought. Or having that conversation with that, that person has just clarified it for me and I can see this clearly now. But we need to do that on a day-to-day, -day, week to week month-to-month -month basis just to be able to get through the drudgery that we, we have to sometimes get through. Uh, the second one, the aspirational resilience. This is the ones that entrepreneurs will really engage with. Silence the inner critic or challenge the inner critic. That little voice that's inside your head that's always going, you idiot, you know you can't do this. What makes you think you're good enough? An imposter. And I don't care how positive we are and how much I talk about this. I've still got this inner critic going, you idiot, why would yeah. you think? Because I've got to that place of 100% reliable and now I want to go further. And as soon as we want to go further, there are new challenges. And that little inner critic's going, can you really do this? Do you have the ability? Okay, let me go away and have a look at those resources. So we've got to challenge that inner critic. Five ways to be able to do that. Uh, and this is the next six levels of the uh, aspirational resilience. So the first one is challenging inner critic. Second one is practice self-appreciation. This is recognizing the little things that you do well and celebrating them. I know it's a cliche thing, but it really does make a difference. We've got to celebrate the little stuff. Recognize when we make a micro improvement and just go, damn, I'm good. Because when we celebrate that little micro improvement, it gives us encouragement to keep on going. Yeah, we want to celebrate the big ones with other people, but every step along the way, we've got to start getting that boost of uh, 
um, the, the, the good chemicals in our brain, um, and I can't think of which the good chemicals are at the moment, I'm, I'm so into my resilience, um, but we, we get that boost into our brain that just goes, yes, keep on going. Um, sure. And the third one is draw strength from the successes, right? We have success, we've got to draw strength from that process and be able to repeat that process. The fourth one is be great at what you do best. Most of the time we underrate what we do best because we've got this little inner credit going, yes, you yeah. can do it well, but you're an idiot. So if you're an idiot, everybody else can do it better than you. Yeah. But we've got to be great at what we do best while still broadening ourselves and trying to, to you know, learn from other people. But be great at what we do best. Accept genuine compliments. These are really important because we've got to remember when people recognize we do things well, because every now and then we're going to do something really stupid. And if that's the only thing we focus on, that little inner critic's going to go, see, I told you, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. <laughs> but remembering the compliments will keep you boosted, keep your morale up. People recognize I've done well. Yes, yeah. I've made a mistake. This is an aberration, right? So we've got to accept those genuine compliments and remember them. And genuine is a really important part there. The sixth one is be congruent with your purpose. Be congruent with what's meaningful to you, right? And push on that level. Don't go out of your way to prove other people wrong. Uh, don't go out of your way to just show off. Because when those things go wrong, that's when that little inner critic goes, yeah, I told you, you're uh -huh. an idiot. You stuffed this up and it's not even meaningful to you. Yep. Uh, and when somebody stirs you up about, oh, see, you've made a mistake. You go, oh, gosh, I don't want to even talk about this. It was stupid. When we could grow up, when we're passionate about something, when we make a mistake in that environment where we really want to make this happen and people go, you idiot, you go, I don't care. I don't care what you're saying. And we want to just keep on pushing forward. And that's the value of being congruent. So that's functional resilience and aspirational resilience. And we, the most important thing is that most of the time the entrepreneur will be in this aspirational stage. Mm -hmm. But when we see those signs that I'm getting tired, I'm getting stressed, things aren't going quite right, I'm uh, overworking myself, Let's just flip back to functional resilience for an hour, a day, yeah. a little holiday. Indulge yourself and then come back and power into it again. Yeah, that's huge. Derek, where can people find you? Uh, Derek at DerekMcManus.com is my email. DerekMcManus.com is my website. Um, and link up with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or all those socials. Um, with COVID closing down, I am coming to America. So anybody who would love me to come and speak at their business or uh, wherever it might be, a conference, would love to hear from them. Great. They're great. Hopefully that opens up for you here like really soon. I know there's a lot of conferences coming up uh, yeah. the rest of the summer and into the fall. So you should, you should uh, have a lot of work out here in America. Uh, I love the idea of it. I've been to America four times already. Uh, and then COVID closed it all down. Looking yeah. forward to getting back there. Awesome. Well, we're, we're hope, hopefully we can get you back here as soon as possible. Now, uh, Derek, big question. Here's what I ask everybody at the end of the podcast. You ready for this? I am. If you could buy land anywhere, sorry, we're land life. Obviously we buy and sell. Yep, yep. Land. If you could buy land anywhere in the whole world, where would it be and why? And you're going to give us a different perspective because you're far away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I love where I live. Absolutely love where I live and I'd love to buy more land here and just develop it. Uh, the land that I want is in Scotland. That's where I was born. Okay. I'd love to have a plot of land back there with a little castle on it. Just a little castle. I don't need a big one. Just a little, <laughs> nothing little huge. One. Uh, no, nothing huge. Um, but that's where I'd like to go. But the, the land that, you know, overall that I want um, essentially is country land with space to plant a couple of cows and yes i know what i said there plant a couple of cows <laughs> um i want country land with ocean views and a little waterfall at the side of the house that i can just hear running every day wow. um, that's the kind of land that just feeds me i haven't that's seen anywhere good. where it actually is at the moment but I'm still it's out there waiting for you derek it's waiting yeah, for absolutely. you absolutely it's, it's out there it's, it's calling your name you just got to get out there there's a little castle out there too well, Derek, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a, a ton of stuff that I will absolutely be able to apply, um, which I, I genuinely appreciate that. And I, I thank you for doing that. Um, 
Yeah. So thanks for being here, Derek. PJ, it's been an absolute pleasure. Love the conversation. Love what you're doing. And um, if there's an opportunity to get back on here and have another conversation, would love that too. Derek, I think we could talk for two or three hours. If we certainly could. <laughs> we, we could definitely have a much longer podcast. I love so. the way your mind works. <laughs> Great conversation, guys. I guarantee you learned a lot. Um, till next time on Land Life. I look forward to it. Take care. Bye.